Hi, and welcome back. We're going to be reading from The Boy Who Dared by Susan Campbell Bartoletti today. We are starting on page 122. We're starting right here at the bottom on the page break. <clears throat> September. Helmuth decides it's time to bring Carl and Rudy together so they can all listen to the BBC. As he waits for Carl one night, he grows impatient. Usually, Carl is right on time, but tonight he is late. At last, at the familiar knock, Helmuth flings open the door. Where have you been? he asks. Helmuth doesn't wait for Carl to answer. He beckons him inside. At the kitchen table sits Rudy. The two boys stare in shock at each other and then in betrayal at Helmuth. Helmuth ushers them inside, outside, saying, Let's get some fresh air. I'll explain everything. Outside, Carl paces back and forth, angry. Why the secrecy, Helmuth? Didn't you think you could trust us? Of course I trust you, says Helmuth. It was for your own protection, your own safety. Safety, says Carl. That's what the Nazis say when they keep the truth from us. It's not the same thing, says Helmuth. Suppose the Gestapo arrested you, or Rudy. Suppose they questioned you. You know they'll stop at nothing to get names. This way you only knew one name. Mine. <clears throat> Fear flashes across Rudy's face. He's right, Carl. Remember what happened to me in the hospital? But Helmuth wasn't honest with us, says Carl. We had a right to know. We are not Nazis. The words sting, but Helmuth knows that Carl is right, even if Helmuth's intentions were good. I'm sorry, he says. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Carl, let's the apology settle over him. All right, he says. It's nearly 10 o'clock. Let's go inside. And just like that, the tension is lifted as the three friends head inside. In the kitchen, Helmuth tries to tune in London. The radio bleeps and buzzes and squawks and crackles so much that it's impossible to hear a word. He waits a few minutes, tries again, turning the dial this way and that, but no use. The jamming is too strong. Maybe it's for the best, says Rudy. He stands, looks anxious to leave. Carl stands, too. Helmuth remains seated. He looks at his friends. Wait, there's another reason I brought you to there's another reason why I brought you together tonight. I want you both to know that I've decided to serve the fatherland. Carl and Rudy look at Helmuth uneasily. What do you mean? says Carl. Helmuth goes into his bathroom. He returns with his carefully written notes and a short stack of handwritten leaflets. He hands one to Carl, who reads out loud, It's all Hitler's fault. <clears throat> Carl looks at Helmuth in disbelief, continues reading. During the unrestricted air raids, several hundred thousand defenseless civilians were killed. The British Royal Air Force is not to blame for these killings. Their flights are retaliation for those killed by the German Luftwaffe in Warsaw and Rotterdam. The Luftwaffe murdered defenseless women and children, cripples and old men. Are you crazy? says Rudy. I've got more, says Helmuth. He pages through the leaflets, read, reads off others that he has written. Hitler the murderer. They're not telling you everything. Where is Rudolf Hess and Hitler Youth? <clears throat> Rudy grabs the Hitler Youth flyer. German boys, he reads. Do you know what the Hitler Youth is and what goals it pursues? Rudy grunts in agreement. It's a compulsory organization of the highest order for the cultivation of obedient Nazis. You sure got that right, says Carl. These flyers are really something, the way you attack the Nazis. Helmuth looks earnestly at his friends. We must attack. We're being lied to. We must let people know the truth. Read the last line, Carl. This is a chain letter, so please pass it on, reads Carl. <clears throat> this is a war against lies, says Helmuth. If we want to win, we can't attack in straight lines. We'll leave leaflets everywhere. In telephone booths, mailboxes, apartment houses, for people to read and to pass on, like a chain letter. They'll pass them on all right, right to the Gestapo, says Carl. Helmuth, says Rudy, remember our Lord Lister ID cards, how quickly they were passed to, get to the Gestapo? And this is worse, it's no game. <clears throat> of course it's no game. Every day, the newspaper tells us about people who are sentenced to death or prison for breaking the radio law when all they want is the truth. This is serious. Do you really think we can fight the Nazi government, says Carl? They're too big, too powerful. 
We must fight with words and actions. Not everyone agrees with Hitler and the Nazi party, says Helmuth. If we tell the real story about the war, show people that they're not alone, they will start to talk. Then they will grow in strength and numbers. What if the Gestapo catches us, asks Karl. It's serious to break the law like this. This kind of law must be broken. And besides, the Gestapo will never catch us, says Helmuth. We'll make sure they don't. They might find the leaflets, but they won't know who did it, and they'll never suspect kids. But what if they do, says Rudy. Helmuth considers the possibility. Then that person should take all the blame, he says decidedly. Rudy's eyes widen. He looks at Carl. We're all under 18, says Helmuth. Even if we are caught, we won't be tried as adults. He stares at the pamphlets. I don't want to remember a time I could have done something, but I didn't. The boys are silent for a long moment. You're right, says Carl, sticking out his hand. Count me in. No names. No names, says Rudy. No names, says Helmuth. The boys pump each other's hands vigorously. Helmuth takes half the pamphlets, divides the rest between Carl and Rudy. Outside the flat, on the street, Helmuth watches as Carl and Rudy head down the street. The sky looks like gray wool, and that's a good thing. The cloud cover will keep British bombers away. Helmuth heads in the opposite direction, down Lusenwig. Leaflets tucked beneath his shirt. <clears throat> October comes. The German army continues its advice on advance on Leningrad. Gerhard graduates from training in the Signal Corps and is sent to officer training school in Warsaw. That news makes Hugo as proud of Gerhard as if he were his own. See, Emma, says Hugo, I told you he'd come around. It irritates Helmuth. His relationship with Hugo has not improved, but Helmuth knows having Hugo's last name, Hubener, will have its benefits. <clears throat> no one would ever suspect that the son of a rotten fur would resist the Nazis. At work, at home, Helmuth is a good Nazi, smooth and unruffled on the surface, but paddling furiously beneath. As the leaves change color and drop, it gets so the boys can hardly wait from one weekend to the next. For the Friday and Saturday nights when they turn off the kitchen light and sit in the dark listening to the BBC. From his church, Helmuth brings himself from his church, Helmuth helps himself to carbon paper and typing paper. Bright red paper, rarely used, so it won't be missed. <clears throat> he knows it's wrong to steal from the church, but he tells himself it's for the greater good. It's a war for truth that he is waging. Late into the night in his grandparents' flat, Helmuth pecks away at the old Remington typewriter keys. Oma grows accustomed to the incessant tapping, the constant ring of the carriage return. She never asks what he is doing or if he's getting enough sleep. Instead, she says, My, what a hard worker you are. Your boss must be pleased. At first, Helmuth prepares new leaflets every two weeks, and then every week, and then twice a week. At night, the boys leave them in telephone booths, mailboxes, even tacked to bulletin boards in tenement hallways right next to official Nazi government notices announcing meetings such as tomorrow, home evening, with party comrade to discuss air raid wardens. <clears throat> as time goes on, the boys feel new confidence at how easily their plan is working. From work, Helmuth borrows an official swastika stamper that makes each flyer look like an official government notice, and his grandmother gets used to the constant thump-thump she hears each night at the kitchen table. The stamper is a brazen touch, but it's Carl who astounds Helmuth and Rudy with the risks that he takes. Once Carl tucked flyers into coat pockets in a cloakroom, the coats, he could tell from their medals and insignia, belonged to high Nazi officials. But Carl has a close call one night when he meets two policemen near his, near his flat. He manages to greet the two men with a forceful Heil Hitler. The police question him, demand to know why he is out past curfew, but Carl explains he was visiting a friend in Reismul. The officers let him go with a warning. Carl goes straight home, rushes to the toilet, his hands shaking so badly he can barely unzip his trousers. Those blasted leaflets gave me the trots, he tells the boys the next night. And hearing that, Helmuth and Rudy clutch their stomachs and laugh until tears roll down their cheeks. It would have been easy to leave their leaflet campaign at that, at mailboxes and telephone booths and tenement hallways, but the war takes a dark, unexpected turn in early December when Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. America declares war on Japan, and Germany declares war on America. This makes Hugo crabby and sour. 
Roosevelt has his war now, he says. Thanks to his Jewish advisors, it's all the Jews' fault, you know. All part of their plan to destroy the German Reich. <clears throat> but just as quickly, Hugo catches himself and his gloom disappears. We've got the best army in the world. Someday, after we've beaten them, we'll visit America, my boy. We'll see that Wild West that you like so much. And then something else happens that agitates Helmuth. That makes him more determined to wake up the people of Germany. Brother Warbs returns. It is late December, and the morning light is gray as Helmuth heads to the Bieber house, intent on returning a borrowed book to the City Hall storeroom before his boss, Heinrich Mons, arrives. He passes an old Jewish woman pushing a broom in the street. She wears a yellow star pinned to her frayed brown coat. Like a bright yellow flame, all the Jews wear stars now so Germans can keep an eye on them. Helmuth nearly passes by a small, stooped figure shuffling down the sidewalk. Were it not for his profile, his familiar, sharp nose, Helmuth would not have recognized the old man, Brother Warbs. Helmuth puts his hand on the man's arm. How thin the bony arm feels beneath the coat sleeve. Brother Warbs tugs his arm away in fright, gazes through watery eyes at Helmuth. His face is gray. Brother Warbs? It's me, Helmuth. Brother Warbs wipes his eyes with the back of his hand, tries to pull his arm away. Let me go. It's better for you if you don't know me. Better for all of us. Well, that's when Helmuth sees that Brother Warbs has no teeth. His lips wreathe around swollen gums. My God, what did they do to you? Brother Warbs sways unsteadily. Don't ask. I cannot tell you. Helmuth decides to return the book later, at lunch perhaps, or when he's sent on another errand to file papers. He grasps the man's elbow, guides him home, helps him off with his coat, hangs it on the hook behind the door. Brother Warbs is flat as a mess, dirty dishes, clothes lying around, drawers pulled open. Helmuth helps Brother Warbs to a chair, puts the kettle on, clears a spot at the kitchen table, sets out a chipped teacup, finds peppermint leaves and pinches them into the teapot. The kettle boils. Helmuth pours the water over the leaves, lets the peppermint steep. Brother Warbs' hands tremble as he reaches for the cup. His hands are gnarled, his fingers thick and crooked. Your hands, says Helmuth. What happened? Brother Warbs looks fearful. The SS made me sign a paper. I can only tell you that I was treated well. You must tell me, urges Helmuth. Brother Warbs lowers his voice to a whisper. He tells Helmuth about the concentration camp, about the starvation rations, the guards, the punishments, how he was stripped naked, forced to stand outside, knee-deep in snow, how the guards poured water on his hands, let them freeze, and then hit his hands with a club to warm them up, he says. They broke all my fingers. Helmuth touches a rough, the rough skin, the twisted fingers. Never has he witnessed such inhumanity. Fury burns inside him as he imagines the old man's pain. The Nazis are monsters. How can they get away with this torture? The Gestapo are above the law, says Brother Warbs. Whatever the Führer wants is legal, no matter how inhumane. Hitler himself says so. When the Gestapo question you, you'll admit to anything just to get the pain to stop. They're monstrous bullies, says Helmuth. The way they terrorize the weak. Surely there is something we can do. We must pray for those who hate and persecute us, says Brother Warbs. Pray for them. That's impossible. I hate them. You cannot repay evil with evil, says Brother Warbs. God loves us all. He does not love us more than he loves our enemies. Helmuth takes the old man's stooped shoulders, the pain behind his eyes. Gone is Brother Warbs' spirit. Gone is the old man that Helmuth loved. Shouts and all, in his place, a broken man. Helmuth wishes he could stay longer, but knows his boss will ask questions. He stands, slips his arm around the man's thin shoulders. God bless, Brother Warbs. I'll visit you again soon. It's best if you don't visit me. <clears throat> Helmuth plunges his arms through his coat sleeves, jams his hat on his head. <clears throat> he flings his arms as his feet pound the sidewalk. With each step, he sees images of Brother Warbs' hands. By the time Helmuth reaches the Bieber house and returns the borrowed book, the words to another pamphlet have formed in his head. He carries the words with him all day, letting them sort themselves into phrases, coming together, drifting apart, tumbling over onto themselves, settling into sentences and paragraphs. 
That night, as soon as the supper dishes are cleared and Oma and Opa are safely in bed, Helmuth sets out the typewriter. He inserts carbon paper into the carriage and rolls it into place. Brother Warbs, his toothless gums and his gnarled fingers, soldiers dying in Russia, his grandparents and neighbors hunkered in air raid shelters as bombs fall, burned out Jewish businesses and synagogues, the lies, deception. He can't shake the images, his anger. He must be willing to give up safety and comfort for freedom. That is what Heinrich Mann said. Helmuth's fingers fly over the keys, and by midnight, he has a stack of new leaflets. He expects to feel satisfied, but he doesn't. The Nazis can't get away with these things. The world has gone mad. It's time to think bigger, to escalate the pamphlet campaign, to enlarge his circle so that more Germans learn the truth. There is no time to lose. What will the Nazis do if no one stops them now? All right, that's the end of our reading for today.